right, welcome to another episode of To the Fullest with Jason Froberg. Make sure you give us a like, subscribe, ring the bell, follow us on social media, and uh, support us on Patreon and PayPal. Today on the podcast, we have author of Come Together, Joey Kephart. How you doing, Joey? I'm all right. <laughs> Don't nobody worry about me. But for those of you who do, greatly appreciate it. I love it, man. I love it. So it's an honor to have you on the podcast today. Uh, honor to be right. had on the podcast. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Man. I, uh, I I enjoyed uh, reading. I read uh, read a good little amount of your your book. You got it to me uh, just a few days ago, and I dug into it while I could. And uh, it was a uh, it's, it's a fun read, man. It's a fun read. It's a you know about. Um, you know, well, why don't you tell us what it's about? Actually, why don't I not do your job for you? All righty. Well, instead of come together right now over me, let's go with come together right now beside me, okay? Because um, we're side by side in this journey of life, and we've created so much division that I just got fed up with the division and want us to come together in more unity on several subjects, but the one that was uh, most impactful that has been part of my life for as long back as I can remember is policing in America. For whatever reason, police are drawn to me. <laughs> I don't know what it is. <laughs> like, you're like, you know, beat a honey. They've always, let's see what that guy's up to right now. So, yeah, I got to write in on the topic, and I hope enough of you is read it and get the message, which me and Jason will get into a little more of that. For now, that was my intro. Okay, well, <laughs> why don't we start with, uh, why don't you tell us what inspired you to actually write this book and actually sit down and start putting pen to paper and go through the whole process of completing a book, editing a book, and uh, publishing a book? Well, as I uh, stated just a bit ago here, the subject matter has been such a part of my life for 80% of my life, it seems like now. The inspiration that led to actually sitting down in writing was a contributing factor was the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, I didn't have free time on my hands. You know, you, you work, you grind, you pay your bills. All of a sudden, I have no work and I have this time on my hands. And initially when the, the pandemic started in, uh, was that now March of 2020? Yeah. And in Vegas, the weather was accommodating to take off all day and go for urban hikes. I, even if I wasn't able to get out to surrounding nature, whether it was Red Rock or Mount Charleston, I live in vintage Vegas. So I would just hike the old neighborhoods with my dog and just really get into the architecture, some of the classic vehicles. And of course this was all heightened under the influence of psychedelics. I had the free time on my hands and had went some years without going down that road and then all of a sudden I was like, I miss it. It was the one drug, well, I can't even really call it a drug. Okay? Yeah, I, yeah, I refer to it as medicine. Yeah, honestly, yeah. Man. I mean, <clears throat> it was an eye opener, mind opener that I had missed. So I got back into it and I'd take off for the whole day, just hiking around the city. And then of course in Vegas, our weather got too hot to be outside all day. So what's a man to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take a little more psychedelics and start writing. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, um, and then this topic, of course, like I said, being such a huge part of my life, 
was um like let's get to it enough of being a bystander get in there and have your say my youngest brother was initially a very huge inspiration to me because before I sat down with the book I started emailing chiefs of police um, senators governors top executives in my company and I would share these email exchanges with my youngest brother and he'd be like bro you you always had a gift with the written word you should do something with that and he actually sent me um, these links to Barefoot Writer where you know you could sign up for their program you, you'd pay a fee and be under their tutelage some and then maybe you'd write small articles for magazines different things and I was like out of heck with that I'll just write a book <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just like went for broken got down in the room like I said when that comfortable temperatures wore off I'd get down into um, my room try to commit at least an hour a day to writing if the flow was there for more I do more you know and within a short time period I did get some flow and some cadence I could already see after chapter probably halfway through chapter two like hey this is where I'm going with the middle this is where I want it to end this is where we'll get off the beaten track for a little bit as long as we get back on the track Lot when people would ask me, I, I tell them a lot, like the advantage I had when I was writing is I've been known to be a talker. And when you talk, a lot of times people they're like, I'm done listening to this guy, man. So they just <laughs> want to get off the phone with you, you know. But when you write, they have the luxury of like, I've heard enough, I've read enough, I could put this down now. And I'll go back to it. And what I would do is I would make the equation a lot that like the content was a tree trunk. And of course you have branches. So these branches spew off the trunk. As long as they come back to that trunk, it's all right. You know, they, um, I took some flack actually from the uh, initial book writing company I signed up with for that style, that approach. And I was like, where have you people been? Because like, I think Quentin Tarantino started this some time back. <laughs> <laughs> and so they got fired. <laughs> and me and my niece picked up the project and um, she did the editing. She was... um so like into it herself you know because i'm her uncle but also the subject that she would share with me that most of her editing was really correct in the editing they done and got back to what i was oh, trying wow. to say yeah so well it's a lot of fun i uh i actually really enjoyed the book you know i mean the the core topic of the book uh being the um the relationship that the public have with the police and um you know where we are as a society with that and where we're going with that but then it's also very um autobiographical you know it, it tells a lot about your youth and your life story and growing up in um niagara falls which is the title right once upon a time in falsywood so you're talking about the falls and, and, and that right there, right? Yes. And, uh, and man, you had a wild youth, man. It was, it was actually a lot of fun to read. I started really, uh, it start, turned into a page turner for me, man. I was really enjoying your, uh, your adventures and your, your reckless youth and parties and uh, all the interesting characters you were introducing. And yeah, it, it, it honestly, and it reminded me a lot of um, my, my youth growing up, man. I really, I really felt a lot of connection there because I was I was also a young rambunctious kid and I grew up in Stockton California 
getting into trouble and getting into scuffs with the law and uh you know partying too much and probably a little too much uh you know drugs and alcohol and uh rock and roll and well, heavy metal yeah. for, on my end right and uh no, it was a lot of fun, man. It was a lot of fun to read. And uh, I don't know. Um, why don't you take a, well, you, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, growing up in Niagara Falls and the, uh, the chaos that ensued with all that? Well, first, I want to thank you for um, getting into the book enough and being in, in tune to it to catch that. Because when people ask me about well, what kind of book is this? That's pretty much how I describe it, Jason. It's a fusion. When I listen to music, I've always preferred fusions. I like, you know, folk rock, psych rock, funk jazz, you know. And so the book, I took a fusion approach. It's an autobiography with a message of social reform. And growing up in Niagara Falls, like I said, the subject matter became part of my life as early as a 15-year-old attending high school basketball games. And because I'd be under the influence of marijuana, and the police at that time, you know, they weren't as hip as some of the officers are now. They didn't know how to really di differentiate between like, maybe this guy's just smoking pot to like, this guy's on some kind of shit, he's on some kind of drugs. So when I'd attend these basketball games, they'd actually put me up against the wall and frisk me and you know look between my fingernails, everything. And I had no, no idea what they were even looking for because that wasn't my lifestyle, but I had heard it was because of people who did intravenous drugs. That's where they would shoot them up. But I was only under the influence of marijuana. And, um, you know, they're just doing their job to some degree. But, you know, to some degree, they're, they're, they were being overzealous. And I dealt with that throughout my life, both there and in Las Vegas, like, um, besides that high school basketball game I'm referencing, one of my first real interactions, exchanges with them was coming home from a basketball game, there was always a, a threat of rival high schools breaking out into a little bit of a, a, a rumble. Fortunately, in this day and age, these rumbles were, they were with our hands and feet, you know what I mean? You didn't have the, the, the threat of guns or knives, you know. I mean, this is like the late 1970s. So, yes, I just gave away my age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, so, you know, the police, my first encounter, is a 16-year-old. And I'm walking a friend home from the basketball game who was on crutches. And we had another friend who, this guy was so athletic. So, so just agility off the charts that um, the police were trying to catch him and put him into custody and they couldn't catch him. I mean, he's dodging for them. It's, it's like a Rocky chasing the chicken in the Rocky movie. And I'm, I'm high. <laughs> I'm smoking pot, of course. It caused some laughter, you know. And uh, the police officer was very very offended by this and he said you know are you laughing at me i'm like no sir officer i know better than to laugh at you you know he goes i don't believe you and i said well i'm sorry but you know, i was laughing at a joke my friend just told me and next thing i know he swung he swung a punch at me and um i knew better than to hit a police officer but i also had the common sense to not let anybody hit me. <laughs> so I started putting up my hands and just doing, choo, 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 just blocking everything they were throwing. Next thing you know, I'm grabbed from behind by another police officer. And then I'm taking blows to the face, thrown on the ground and I'm beat up 
by a total of four of them and hauled off to jail. And my my pops being the man that he he was, he was a, a World War II veteran, coal miner, union leader, just straight out asked me like when, after he let me sit three days, uh, tough love, you know, um, then he asked me, he says, did you do what the police said? I said, nah, Pops, if 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 I can be, beat up four police officers, because I was being accused of assault on four police officers, they need to find a new job. <laughs> he goes, that's what I thought. So instead of the $50 fine, he went and paid $750 for a lawyer. This is 1979. So, um, like I mentioned in the book, you know, I mean, might have been like $750 out of the pocketbook, but it was a life lesson learned that just stayed with me, you know, I mean, and uh, we went to court, we lost, but like I said, we, we won in life lesson, so that was cool, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, I yeah, and uh, and I believe in the in the book you tell that story, right? Um, like they let everybody off. They just say, you know, they plead guilty and they give them probation and a fifty dollar fine. And since you fought it, they were like, well, we can't say that four cops beat you up because then you have a lawsuit against the city. So we're gonna find you guilty, you know, and give you a, what a year of probation or something like that. And it's like, yeah, you can't just you can't just go against the 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 court system and the police system and everything and expect it like come out right on top of it. I believe that's kind of the lesson lesson you were learning mm -hmm. was uh, even though you're in the right, it's like the the judge under no circumstances is going to allow you to, to have some kind of case against the city. You know? Yeah. Especially in that day and age. I mean, the judge straight out kept it real and said, listen, I got to work with these people every day. <laughs> so no, I can't find you innocent because I have to work with them and you're gonna have a lawsuit on your hands. Which, to fast forward some, this followed in the family because when we talk about what inspired me to write this book, I don't know, I'm not saying I'm the only one who can say this, but I'm definitely in the minority. I was rated by SWAT in 1989, over 53 grams of marijuana. I was beat to a bloody mess. I was sent to jail for a year. Let's fast forward to 2004. My daughter, after high school graduation, was out partying. She knew better to drive home drunk. She has to sleep on the couch. She slept on the couch of this home the police suspected some marijuana in the home. They perform a raid. This time they use a flashbang device. It lands on her. It sets her on fire. She spends 16 days in a burn treatment center. Now, I don't know who's familiar with viewing burn victims, but this is especially when it's your daughter, was just horrendous to have to hear her in the next room just screaming every time they were scraping that skin. And she was, of course, given um, pain medication in that time period, you know, even a little more so than now. I mean, it was quite abundant, and it was just a huge part problem in America. And she got addicted to the opiates. So... um then we fast forward to 2012. What's my son's career of choice? He becomes a police officer. Eventually he becomes a SWAT police officer at that. Now he had the decency, even in training for SWAT, to share this story of my daughter with his trainers. And they used that as a, a tool to teach, you know, the, the um, upcoming SWAT police officers to like, yes, we have a job to do, but we have to do it with the right amount of force, not, 
not overly so. And, um, you know, I, I want to make that point because my, my book, the subject, the title, it's come together. In spite of the run-ins that I've had with the law over the years, I still carry a lot of respect for them. You know, I, I mean, I know they have a tough job to do. If I see them out and about, example, one time I'm at Target and drove my wife crazy that I still do that I did this, but I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go say hi to them and she's, Joey, they don't know your intention. You don't do that. This is a rough time, you know. And I was like. I'm going to share with them my intention, <laughs> you know? And I walk right up to the police officers. Hey, you know, my son does. He's on a force. He's Austin, Texas SWAT police officer, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, nothing but respect for you guys. And even in this day and age, like I get pulled over for bicycling to work sometimes for the oddest reasons. Like I don't have my bicycle light on. Officer, it's 10 a.m. You know, it's, I didn't know it needed to be on, but, you know, and they can be zealous in that approach. And I remind myself, like, listen, this is not the officer who beat you up 34 years ago, okay? This is a young man just trying to learn his job. And I make sure my energy is the right energy. And therefore, even if he starts off a little on the zealous side it becomes difficult for him to continue down that road and obviously we both walked away all right i'm here with jason you know doing this so you know i i don't want people to get the wrong idea that like because by no stretch am i anti-police you know i'm anti-misbehavior whether that's a citizen or a police officer and I'm pro de-escalation versus escalation and we know how important that initial energy you bring in to an encounter can sway it one way or another I mean I come in here for this podcast I never did anything like this Jason's energy with me from jump to make me comfortable to do this and share my story. This, this can be done out there too. Yeah. You know, that's all. And thank you for that, man. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's all love, man. It's all love. And I mean, I've, I personally, I've had run-ins with the police, especially growing up in Stockton. We've, uh, you know, dealt with assaults and uh, all kinds of unnecessary violence and, and escalation, as you're saying as opposed to de-escalation in situations where they just dis decide that they're going to start swinging their power around, uh, as opposed to just acting like decent people, mm. you know. There's the whole good, good guy, bad guy mythos in that, in that uh, world, in that ideology of the, uh, the police officer just out trying to stop bad guys. And it's like, well, when you're policing citizens and you think everybody's a bad guy, that's really not a good way to go about it, man. And my grandfather was a highway patrolman, and he would say, you know, 70% of people are just good, upstanding citizens. 20% of people just are confused and don't know what the hell's mm -hmm. going on, and they're kind of off on the wrong foot. And then 10% of people are evil fucking scumbags, and they need to be <laughs> taken care of. Yes. Because uh, they're out up to no good, they're animals, and they're predators, and there's you know, and there are those people out there, you know. But it's like the, the whole concept that when uh, some people that get this badge going they 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 go out there and they think that everybody's a bad guy and they're the good guy and everybody's a bad guy and everybody they run into is going to get that wrath you know that righteousness and that's really um an issue that we're yeah. still dealing with as a society which has been which has led to the insanity of the defund the police movement you know and everything that happened with george floyd or even this recent thing that just happened i believe in minneapolis where the I don't know if you saw that, uh, that just happened, but a man was executed in a convenience store. There was four, four police officers on top of this guy. And uh, another police officer came in and jumped in on it and said, fuck this, pulled out her gun 
executed. I mean, the guy wasn't going anywhere. Yeah. You know, he could have just wriggled on the floor and until he was worn out. And it was just like, you know, probably that, that officer is probably just a rookie who didn't know what the hell they were doing. I don't know. I don't know. And they just weren't prepared for that situation. Yeah. And, um, you know, they, I don't know if they should ever put a badge on in the first place if that's how they deal with the situation, right? It's like the other officers kind of had it handled. No, that's that's a huge point, Jason, because in the book, I get into that where the vetting, the pre-screening should be to the point that it can never be guaranteed, but we need to do a much better job in not letting those personalities get in. Yeah. And then, you know, we're going to do, I've had such a wide range of energy exchanges with police from, like I said, I've shared with you the brutality that I've been a victim of, but also I was incarcerated for a year, jail, not prison, that's it, but the jail guards, they turned my life around. Because they voiced to me that we see something in you we don't see in most most inmates. So they treated me with the utmost respect, more than I had ever encountered outside of the jail, really, from somebody wearing a badge. But um, they contributed hugely to me when I gave them my word that you won't see me again. I'm one and done. That's it. That was my saying in there. One and done. Because they used to ask me, what the hell are you laughing at, Capart? Why are you smiling? You're in jail. They ain't never going to let you out of here. One and done, guys. And I took pride in being a man of my word. I, I told them I ain't coming back. I got out. I worked at the measliest wages, whatever, but I wasn't having my freedom taken away again. So, And they, they contributed to that. And that's something I think police miss a lot. They miss opportunities where when they have us pulled over on little encounters, um, whether it's traffic stop, whether you're a juvenile who's, uh, you know, has to deal with um, law enforcement for the first time, they can change your life somewhat. Yeah if they really take the time and make that effort. I even know recently during some uh, times when they push police and citizens to have a more um, communal coexistence, getting along better, and I'd be out walking my boxer, and uh, there would be a lady police officer who well, it must have been on um, graveyard shift and her shift would be ending. And she'd stop her car to get out of the car and meet my dog and and spend time with my dog. I mean, this is almost like a throwback to 1950s America. Yeah. But we need to get back there in order for citizens to have more trust in the police because... um. You know, policing, like I said, I, I understand the struggles. In the same token, you know, um, this, I mentioned in the book, prior to Rodney King, the exposure wasn't there. Yeah. You know, I, I was, like I said, when I'm 16, 17, 18, they could beat you up, charge you with crimes, and it was their word against my word. Guess how that was ending, okay? I mean, we seen it. I, I was told straight out by a judge, sorry, you lose. Now, you know, that's one of the pros and cons of technology, man. I mean, we have the technology to catch them in the act and the hor horrendous behavior at times that we s see. I still think it's gotten somewhat better because of that exposure. Like I said, when I was young, forget it, man. There was a reason the elevator trip from the police car to the jail cell was padded. Yeah. Because you took a beating, man. 
Oh, yeah. I've seen that firsthand. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, growing up, it was, there was, uh, I, I've experienced it on both sides, you know? We'd be smoking weed in the park and uh, just too fucking high to be keeping an eye out. And all of a sudden, there's just like a cop standing next to you. And you're like, oh, shit. You know? And he's like, well, uh, you know, there's, you, there's two ways this can go, you know? Yeah. You can, I can dig in your fucking pockets or you can give me your weed right now and uh, I'll let you make that decision. And you just go, fuck it, man. And you hand him your butt. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sorry, I'm dumb, you know, and hand him the pipe and he would take the pipe and knock all the weed out, go, I don't need that. Take my weed and go get the fuck out of here, you know? And he could have fucked my whole life up. Yeah. And uh, instead it was just like, stop being dumb, kid. You know, like that's... And that's a beautiful way to deal with the problem as opposed to just, you know, completely ruining someone's life. Yeah. And then there's other situations where we'd be hanging out in the park and the cops would rush up on us and immediately start hitting us, smacking our friends around and shit. And then you'd be like, what the fuck is your problem, man? And they're like, okay, you too. And they come at you know, and, yep. and I've been arrested for assaulting police officers because I shoved a cop down some bleachers one time who was beating the fuck out of one of my friends. And, uh, you know, and yeah. they are just, uh, it's, it's, it was just a wrong way to handle a situation. There no. was no, no need for any of that. It wasn't like anybody was, we were all sitting on a, on bleachers at a park watching a soccer game, you know? And it's like, they're just fucking assholes who just have some hair up their ass and some righteous authority right. complex and they start assaulting and we were teenagers. No, my, at, my friend was 14 at the time. Absolutely. That's the first, like I said, in the early part of the book, that's my first encounter with them. When, and I state, like, who were the criminals in this act? Yeah. Because we're just trying to get home from a basketball game. Um, the only rumble was them beating on us. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, it's, and when it comes to pot, I mean, yeah, we're finally there in most of the states now. And I don't use anywhere near like I used to when I was young. But my attitude has not changed one bit towards it. First time I got in trouble for marijuana as a 16-year-old, I told the police then, I said, listen, guys, I said, you don't go home after a long day dealing with us punks and smoke up a joint once in a while. They're like, absolutely not. It's against the law, Joey. I said, okay. I said, you stop off at the corner bar, have a couple beers, shoot some pool, put some money in the jukebox, have a couple more beers. I said, yeah. Who's driving home? Oh. Yeah, and this is before you knew... You know, they were taking cabs or Uber. They're hopping in the car, driving home drunk, right? Yeah, because so, what, what are they going to do? Get pulled over by another cop and be like, it? hey, I'm fucking, what are you going to do about it? They're not going to so, arrest each other for drunk driving. So I even said this. I said, on any day, let's do this experiment. You take two 16-year-old kids. Now, you got to remember, it's 1979. Give them $10 worth of cheap whiskey. Give them $10 worth of cheap marijuana. The, I mean, marijuana the next night. You tell me which two teenage boys you'd rather be around. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't even close, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. I, and I'm, I'm more of an advocate for decriminalizing all the drugs, man, at least on a federal level, you know? And, like, let the states decide if they really want to deal with that as, yeah. as, like, a criminal problem or, you know, like, it's, it's just people's consciousness should, people should be allowed to experiment with their consciousness however the way they want and uh and the government shouldn't be getting involved in that and they sh especially shouldn't be throwing people in fucking cages over it right you know kicking people's doors in that's just um totalitarian man you know Absolutely. That's, it's really it's unnecessary it's completely unnecessary and to think and it's like it's not going anywhere you know, like they started this war on drugs forever ago before I was even born, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's done nothing but made drugs more rampant, more expensive, and honestly, more e easily attainable. It's like when we were growing up, it was easy to get 
anything I wanted. Alcohol was the hard thing. Right. right Alcohol right. was the hardest part. <laughs> Drugs I could get at any time, anywhere. Yeah. And it was just, it was like, it wasn't even an effort. It was like always there yeah. because it's so rampant. It's so profitable for people to sell it because it's illegal. But if it's like, if it was all legal, then where's the, you know, then, then it becomes much more difficult for young, young teens to get their hands on it because who's going to risk you know, dealing with all these drugs when uh, it's already at, the, it's like with marijuana, you know, how many people do you know that sell marijuana anymore? You know, like everybody just goes and gets it from the store. Right. You know, there's not a, there's not this homie who's got weed that you call and that, you know, yeah. I'm just like, I'll just stop at any corner store and get it. And it's, so it's going to become an issue where as a teenager, it'll be a lot more difficult to get marijuana, I would imagine, like yeah. in, the, in the next 10 years or, or so. Because you have to pull, like you were referring, where you got stand out there, get an older guy to go in and purchase for yeah. you like we used to with, with alcohol. And most of these uh, dispensaries have a security guard out right out front. Yeah. So that's not happening anyways, you know. Yeah, good points. So, and speaking of, uh, of, of, enjoying these things you've mentioned lsd a couple times and i'm actually an only absolute, a couple <laughs> an absolute fan of the psychedelic experience i think it's one of the most important experiences that anybody can have in their lifetime and um and i'm i'm a huge advocate for that and i believe it's 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 a path to the higher self and to true awareness and to finding answers that normally would not be available to you under your uh regular cognitive thought processes and uh i'd love for you to share some of your experiences with lsd why don't you tell us some of your like how, how what's your opinion on it well, tell us a good story about uh, dropping acid in the 70s <laughs> do i keep it to one <laughs> or can, or can, can we go man yeah we could do whatever under we want. five podcast, let, let, let's podcast. go under five right jason yeah first of all we can only speculate but what if i wrote this book without having ever delved into psychedelics. Yeah. Good chance I may not have. Because whether this is scientifically proven or not, which I actually believe it is, and you might be able to help me on this one, Jason. Yeah. Um, whether I stopped using for the stretch that I did, because I went, I must have went at least 20 years without using psychedelics. Wow. But was it still in there? Of course. And did it play it. In, into the creativity and the flow that I got with this book? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I'm a believer in that. And, um, and once I sat down is when I, like earlier shared, which I did get back into it. Now, my father's teachings, he always stressed to me growing up, everything in moderation, Joe, everything in moderation. Okay, Pops, I'll only do acid once a week. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that's all you can really get away with anyway. Yeah. If you're doing it the day after an acid trip, it's like completely ineffective. Now, my brother, you know? who I bring up in the book, he got to the point that, I don't know, he might go two, three days in a row. How? He, he'd go on some binges with this stuff, man. And he'd have to increase from, LSD, man. <laughs> yeah, he'd increase from two doses to three or four to next before I'd have to like, all right, bro, come on, man. Let's let, you know, yeah. and I'd bring him back. But, um, one of, uh, what initially started off is what was going to be my first bad trip ever. Those okay. are the best ones. Yeah, it, it started off that way. And thanks to my brother, who's mentioned in the book quite a bit, and he's on the cover. Because I guess we were never going to make it on the cover of the Rolling Stone. <laughs> so, so I did my own thing, man. Yeah. And um, I'd had a best friend of mine pass away. And it was like just after we, 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 we put him to rest. And I, I took LSD. And I'm out there roaming the streets and all of a sudden I, the floodgates opened and and I started getting just overwhelmed by you know that I just had to put one of my best friends down and and I come back to our, we we ran a bar 
in Niagara Falls at the time, Kephart's Cove. And I come back in. My mom had always said I wore my feelings on my shirt sleeve. My brother could see instantly, like, whoa, Joey ain't right. So I go lock myself in the door, in the bathroom, shut the door. He's like coaxing me to come out. Now I come out eventually. He has the bar closed. And we just go to the turntable, use the DJ booth, play our favorite music, drink some more beer, shoot pool, until I come through this. And it only made our brotherly connection that much stronger. And like I said, it was this close to a bad trip. And that was the only time I could even categorize any of my experiences with it as bad, you know, most, most of the time, I'll, you know, just made you think a little deeper. Your conversations weren't just surface. You, you dug deeper. And um, like I said, I mean, I think it gave me a lot of the inner beings to even get to a point that this here <laughs> came from here to here to here before it got to there. Yeah. You know, and I'm glad I'm with somebody who is on the same page because I just don't think without my experience I would have ever had the um, commitment Duh. because it's a book it's 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 not like a magazine article yeah it's a book and and i get reminded by people closest to me like that it is quite an accomplishment and where it goes from here it it's all icing on the cake because i'll have people say to me like you know i wish you you know the biggest success with it and i'm like it already is a success <laughs> you know, it's just levels from here. Yeah. Because every time I read a review, and even Jason today, like, he didn't get through the whole book yet. But during the interview, you you hear it touched him enough that he's remembering stuff. And I'll read some of these reviews, one of which... It's by the SWAT police officer that was part of the raid on my home. Oh, wow. Who writes in his review that I opened his eyes and that police and citizens both need to read this book so we do come to a more harmonious coexistence, that we do have a more mutual respect for each other. To just put yourself in the other person's shoes. Like, we, we, we often forget that. As a citizen, we'll forget what it's like to have to do their job on a daily basis, but they forget how intimidating even the briefest encounter can be. Oh, my, yeah. my wife, just very docile woman, you know, in both size, temperament, she's, you know, and she got pulled over by the police one time for going like 10, 12 miles over the speed limit. To this day, like if we see a police officer, Joey, the police, the police, I'm like, honey, I'm not doing anything. I mean, <laughs> we're, we're just getting to the store, man. It's okay. But they've traumatized her with, yeah. with that initial interaction that was like, it was aggressive. Like, I mean, no, she didn't get beat up, but just verbal assault. You yeah. know, that, that didn't need to be done over to someone who this is the first time you're she's being issued a ticket she's going 12 miles over the speed limit relax you know yeah it's a uh, it's one of those uh fine line things it's a very difficult job mm -hmm. you know and they're they're doing uh something that has to be done you know there's no there's no getting rid of police officers, you know, that's just going to create anarchy and, and uh, just a lawless society full of uh, just 
the horribleness you know it'll be unbearable and uh and they're they're good guys i mean mm-hmm. Like I work in the entertainment industry, we always have uh, police officers hanging out backstage, and you know we invite them over to kick it. Like yeah. we're like, "Hey man, come sit down. You got a table here, man. You want some coffee?" And uh, and we'll tell stories back and forth. And the stuff that they're getting into, man. I mean, it's what they have to deal with is is uh, excessive mm-hmm. to say the least. You know, so um, you can't really we can't really expect them to be perfect. But it is it. It's nice when they're better, you know. Absolutely. And, I, and I've had experiences yeah. with police plenty of times in both ways, you know. Sometimes they're having a bad day, or sometimes they're a fucking egomaniac, and they just love to, you know. Essentially, they were just like a bully in high school, and mm-hmm. they love pushing people around, and they're gonna continue to do that their entire life because it gets their dick hard. Yeah, and, that's uh, yeah. Yep. That's why I get back into the like we mentioned earlier about. We need to do more vetting on those personalities. Yeah. I mean, put the money into your, I, I don't, wouldn't know what the title is, but the guys that determine whether you're even eligible to go to um, the academy. Yeah. Because the psych evaluation. The psych evaluation. I mean, put a lot of weight into that because when we, hear these numbers that all 99 percent of them are great blah 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 i mentioned one a uh, police chief that was to me quite um honest and against the curve somewhat because even being a police chief he was the first to say and art acevedo he mentioned it on a park podcast himself with um carlos watson that that number, 98, 99%, no, it's not that high. You know, that we have a few bad apples. No, 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 no. We have barrels, but we have acres of good ones too. Let's increase the acreage, decrease those barrels. Yeah. And I think the psych evaluation will be a huge factor. Another thing I think that can be really helpful, my son, like I mentioned earlier, he's an Austin SWAT police officer. The way they are scheduled, they have a week where like, they're on call at all times. You know, They have a week that they do their 40-hour work week. But I think two weeks of 40-hour work week. One week of like around the clock you could be called your, your team. You know? And then one week, do not disturb. Yeah. We, they will not be called for anything. So I think that's important if we could do that in a more universal um, way across the U.S. where, yeah, if the police are grinding for two, three weeks, so don't defund, hire more that you're able to do this where, okay, we, guess what? Kiss this job and the stress of it goodbye. Go hang out with the people that care if, if you're not getting drug tested, go out and smoke a joint or take some shrooms, would you? you know? <laughs> some shrooms would definitely help. <laughs> yeah. And um, hey, what did McCartney say about that? Uh-huh. He, you know, he said, if all world leaders delved into these, there'd be no war. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? so, it's like the shaman coming up from the, the jungles of South America and, and giving all these world leaders ayahuasca ceremonies. Yes. And they're trying to change the world because that kind of spiritual experience, man, you know, where you kind of recognize the oneness with everything, it, uh, it, it'll, it, it changes you. Mm-hmm. It changes you in a big way. You kind of recognize that you're living this character role, this ego bullshit out, and that... Uh, you know, it's not, it's not really you, you know, it's just the role that you're assigned, the character that you're playing and that all the money in the world's never going to make you happy. Right, right. All the power in the world's only going to make you miserable. Yeah. And, uh, maybe let go a little bit. Yeah. Be nicer to everyone around you. Was, do you remember Hendrix, uh, Hendrix's quote on that? Uh, um, it was, uh, you know, we'll have peace when, uh, people, are into the power of love instead of the love of power. 
I love know? that. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. definitely that's beautiful. Yeah, man. Jimmy said that sometimes. You mentioned earlier, like when we were talking about the book too, about you know the police aren't going anywhere. Yeah, that's a point I try to stress. Like, man, hey, we're all in this together. Yeah. So let's have more togetherness. Let's come together versus this division. And you get the media who they don't help one bit because instantly one side of the political aisle leans very heavily towards the police are probably at fault here. Let's, let's find something they did wrong. And then the other side of the political aisle, and everybody knows which sides I'm talking about, but yeah. the other side is like, no, the police are the best example of human beings in this whole world. You know? Which is not, neither one of those things are <laughs> exactly. true. Exactly. Neither one are true, and they're both true. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah, so you know, well, they're, it's, it's, they're heroes and villains and can be yeah. both in the same day, same guy. Yeah, and the media and politicians in general, they like to find those hot, uh, you know, hot button topics, abortion, police, religion, sexuality, yeah. and they, they choose a hard stance on it because most people end up doing that. Most yeah. people end up taking a hard side on it, and then they become very opinionated and, and self-righteous. And so when you have those circumstances, you have those lines being drawn in the sand, the, they're taking advantage of you. You're being taken advantage of. Wake up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like politicians don't fucking care about abortion policies. They care about votes and they're lying to you to get you to vote for them. My, my biggest stance, when you say about making a stance and, and that was perfect. You reminded me of it was my stance in the book is anti ethnocentrism if if i remember one thing i learned in college it was in sociology class ethnocentrism probably the majority is know it but if you don't it basically means my way my thought process is right and the rest of you's got it all fucking wrong man yeah. and where does it what umbrella is it going to fall under the most politics and religion yeah. always and you know and then the political spectrum you're going to get into the damn confirmation bias you could have 10 stats there that probably lean against your your thinking but you find that one that validates your thinking and you're all over that so you know well i mean not only that but like statistics in general uh are always skewed you, you, you take a you take a small sample of a statistical chart and use it to benefit your argument because that one subsection of that statistic really brings out to light you know but when you take the overall it's like chaos theory you know mm -hmm. it's like we can't predict the way weather patterns are going to uh, occur and all these other chaotic uh, examples in the universe but it's like when you take a large enough sample size all of a sudden, everything falls in line to a pattern, and it all makes sense. But when you take this small section, it seems like it's a complete distortion of what right. reality really is. And yeah. that's what happens with statistics and people using statistics to benefit their argument. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's always, it can always be manipulated. And the way you phrase the results and how you present them, it's just, it's all manipulation tactics, yep. man. Amen. <laughs> yeah. And I don't say that often. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a scary thing out there. But yeah, like, you know, to get back to the core topic of it, man, it's like uh, we all should be taking care of each other, you know, not less concerned with being right and more concerned with loving each other. Yeah. Because you can't ever truly be right. You know, the truth is such an obscure thing and it's always changing. It's constantly changing. And uh, to think that you know, you puny little you with your little tiny mind, yeah. that you know the truth, where did you get that information from, right? Media outlets, internet searches, yeah. you know, other people who also don't know the truth, you know? And, and so it's like the, I, I, it's, it's, I'm sure it's been forever, right? but yeah. like it feels like, especially nowadays, people's self-righteousness 
and their attitude towards um, the fact that they know, they know that they know that they know, uh, and that everybody else is wrong and stupid. It's just like that's a fucking terrible way to go oh. through your existence, man. You know, that's just really a bad way to go. And, I mean, friendships, family. I mean, it just it divides. It's it's. Ah, uh, I mean, I don't even want to get into it, but when we are into it, you know, yeah, we're, and it's all around us, yeah. And um, like I said, that's why I stress in the book about ethnocentrism. You know, and as cliche as it is, agree to disagree, but there, you know, there's ways that we, you know you have discussions that you both grow from it. You know, yeah. and and like, wow! I didn't see that side. I'm glad you you showed me that. And then, of course, there are people that like because of that ideology that puny me is right and everybody else is wrong. Yeah, it's just a waste of your energy, you know. And you you can't be sucked in into that one because nobody's gonna grow from it. You know, you're just going to get frustrated. And that's that's sad because we both need to come together there. And, and you know, I don't know how much you notice lately too. Like, and it, it's off a little bit, but like I mentioned earlier about the tree trunk and the branches, and as long as you come back, how kindness has been this growing trend. Like, Shirts all over the place. Be kind, you know, and yeah. stuff like that. And it's infectious. Please, yes. One of my f favorite lyrics ever is, in, is uh, Uncle John's being by the Grateful Dead. All I ask is, are you kind? Yeah. I mean, because if you're genuinely kind, we're gonna be all right. <laughs> you know, we we can do some real positives here man and as cliche as, as, as it sounds like you said it gets infectious yeah we're we're gonna make moves in the right direction yeah man you can spread it man you can spread it i i work really hard whenever i'm around people to just spread as much love as possible keep people's attitudes lifted and really remind everyone like hey man this isn't important none of this matters like we're just here doing a thing right now and the thing is irrelevant as long as we do it with love and you know what? I can say, like, I ain't known Jason for years, but this ain't bullshit, man. Because when I only met him last week for the first time, and I brought him out the book, and, you know, you felt the genuine interest and energy right away, you know? And that made this whole process today. I'm a first timer, Jason's a pro. But I think we did all right. <laughs> I think so, man. I yeah. think we put a nice little podcast yeah. together, brother. I really do. And you know what? It's been around an hour. I think it's uh, I think it's perfect time. I think that's a great way we can we can call it on this thing, man. You know, an hour is what I shoot for. And we covered everything we were shooting for. Really, I think. Yeah. I think. Yeah. But like I said, we had that talk before. Like after an hour, we're gonna lose people's attention span, that's anyways. It. I try to cut it in an hour if I can get that in time. When it shows a little time in the corner, it needs to be uh, under 59 minutes if I can make it happen. So thank you very much, Joe. Oh, I thank really you, appreciate Jason. having you on the thank podcast. You. You've been wonderful. Oh, I plug it. <laughs> yeah. No, we're going to do it right now. <laughs> man. So make sure you check out uh, Come Together, a Once Upon a Time in Falsy Wood by uh, Joey, Joseph Joey Joe Kephart. Pick one, Joe. <laughs> Well, I've been all yeah, of them at days. different times, you know, depending on who uh, I'm talking uh, to. If I'm in front of a judge, I'm Joseph Kephart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I'm in front of friends, it's Joey Joe. But um, uh, on Amazon, it's Come Together Book, Joseph Kephart. You leave out Joey Joe. Come Together Book, Joseph Kephart. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, anybody that's paying attention and Spread the word because I think I'm not just talking about my book. The whole subject matter and energy that me and Jason shared today, let's let's spread that. Let's get that out there more.
Peace, love, happiness. I love it, man. Yeah. So make sure you check him out on uh, social media. He's got a Facebook page. Uh, we'll have the link for the description of the book. In the, uh, we'll have the link for the book in the descriptions <laughs> along with your Facebook page link. Uh, this has been To the Fulls with Jason Froberg. Make sure to uh, give us a like, subscribe, ring the bell, follow us on social media, and support us on Patreon and PayPal. Peace. I am going to bow, but I have to say to the fullest, you lived up to it today, Jason. Thank you. Thank you for watching To the Fullest with Jason Froberg. You can check out more podcasts right here and subscribe by clicking right here.